Some creatures in Dungeons and Dragons are significantly more challenging to run for a dungeon master than others, and often for a variety of different reasons. So today we'll be going over some of the most complicated monsters to run in a campaign. Kicking off list at number 10, we have the Drow Matron Mother. The Matron Mother is a CR20 humanoid. As a Drow, they come with a natural Drow racial ability such as immunity to sleep, summonate spellcasting abilities, advantage on saves versus being charmed, and sensitivity to sunlight. Drow Matron Mothers also have a fully prepared list of cleric spells as if they were 18th level clerics. This alone makes her nearly as complex as a high level player character. Drow Matron Mothers also have legendary distinction, giving them the legendary actions. Legendary actions are actions a creature can use at the end of another creature's turn, usually up to three times per round. Though some abilities require more than one legendary action to use. A creature that potentially has four actions around is a lot more complex to run in an encounter than one that only has its regular action on its turn. Matron Mothers can use legendary actions to do their normal attacks like most creatures with the feature, but they can also cast a spell as a legendary action, expending one action per level expended. The Matron Mother's basic attacks both include nasty side effects. Its demon staff attack allows it to do a decent bit of damage, but also causes a wisdom saving throw on the target or else they become frightened of the Matron Mother. Its other basic attack is a tentacle rod, which forces a constitution saving throw or the target suffers multiple debilitating effects akin to the slow spell. Have movement speed, disadvantage on dexterity saves, no reactions, and they can only use an action or bonus action on its turn, but not both. A real nasty side effect, and the Matron Mother can attack three times with this. The last Drow Matron Mother ability is to summon a CR-10 Yakal Demon as an action. A creature that's a fairly interesting, shape-changing, spellcasting monster in its own right, basically adding all the Yakal's complexity to the Drow Matron Mothers. She can even use two legendary actions to allow the Yakal to attack a creature of her choice. On top of all this, they even have a constant useful bonus action ability to give advantage to their allies in their next attack roll, at the cost of a little bit of psychic damage, courtesy of the evil god Loth that they worship. Narratively, Drow Matron Mothers are the top dogs of their entire society. They're some of the biggest players in the Underdark, and it's normally implied that a Drow Matron Mother also has a full retinue of other Drow monsters at their beck and call. The Drow Matron Mother's combination of legendary abilities, summoning, high-level spellcasting, and its station as the overseer of a ruler of an entire society of Drow makes the Drow Matron Mother one of the most complex monsters to run in the game. And next up at number 9, we have Abolus. Aboliths are CR-10 aberrations. They have a variety of disturbing effects that make them one of the most interesting and complex creatures to run in a game. An Aboliths' main stack block isn't too dense. Like the previous entry, they come equipped with legendary actions. In the case of Aboliths, they have three legendary actions they can use to either make perception checks, do their basic tail attack, or spend two actions to deal 3d6 damage to a creature they have charmed and heal that damage back on themselves. Another challenging aspect of Aboliths is that they are strictly aquatic creatures and aquatic combat naturally adds another layer of complications to an encounter. Onto the regular abilities. They passively project a mucus cloud that can inflict a disease on any creature that attacks it in melee. This disease makes the creature only able to breathe water if they fail a constitution save, which might force the creature to be stuck in the water with the ablith or wrist suffocation. They can also enslave others up to three times per day, giving them the inherent ability to add other monsters or even players to their side in and out of combat and then use the health leeching legendary action on them. Their normal tentacle attack also comes with a similar disease side effect to the mucus cloud, though instead of preventing breathing outside of water, it causes the afflicted to suffer acid damage constantly and prevents them from gaining health while out of water, inevitably killing them unless they become cured or stay in the water. It even has a unique form of telepathy that lets it automatically know the deepest desire of any creature that communicates with it telepathically, if the Aboleth can see the creature. They also have two new types of features complicated monsters often have, regional effects and layer actions. These features will be common for most of the creatures on this list due to the added complexity these additional features create. Regional effects are effects that project in a wider area from the creature's layer, allowed to interact with the players even outside of traditional combat. With the Abolith's regional effects, everything underground within one mile region of the Abolith's layer is slimy, difficult terrain. It also makes water supernaturally brackish in a one mile area, making it impossible to drink. And as an action, it can project an illusion of itself anywhere in that one mile region it has seen or somewhere a creature it's enslaved to can see. The Abolith can sense, speak, and use telepathy from said illusion. Next is the layer actions. Layer actions happen automatically on initiative count 20 and are similar to legendary actions and that they add unique actions the monsters can do outside of their regular turn. Typically, they have restrictions that you can't use the same layer action two turns in a row, giving you yet another thing to keep track of. In the case of the Abolith, it can choose between casting Phantasm Force on all creatures it can see within 60 feet, dragging any creature within 20 feet of a pool of water into a pool on a strength saving throw, or mentally assaulting all creatures it can see within 90 feet for 2d6 psychic damage. Abolith set the bar for complex monsters that's powerful, dangerous, and has far-reaching narrative potential. And at number 8, we have the Beholder. Beholders are CR13 aberrations. 
beholders have a slew of iconic features that originated with them. Despite their popularity, this many unique abilities certainly makes them a fairly complicated creature to run. Starting off with its two regional effects. Any creature within a mile of the Beholder's Lair feels like they're always being watched. Next, when the Beholder sleeps, it creates minor reality warps in a 1 mile radius that vanish 24 hours later. This alone creates nearly infinite options, only limited by your imagination, as it gives you free reign to just make any minor, impossible event happen to players as they get closer to the Beholder. Examples include slime appearing on a statue out of nowhere, marks or signs randomly changing, trinkets of unusual nature appearing out of nowhere, and so on and so on. And then there's the Beholder's Lair actions which allows it to either create a 50-foot square area of slimy, difficult terrain, make walls manifest grasping appendages that can grapple any creatures within 10 feet of the wall, and lastly, it can make an eye appear on a solid surface that shoots one of the Beholder's many eye rays, chosen at random, at a target. Speaking of eye rays, the Beholder's main form of action in combat is its 10 eye rays. On its turn, a Beholder uses up to 3 random rays from a list of 10. These rays can be sorted into status effect rays and damage rays. The status effect rays are the Charming Ray, Paralyzing Ray, Fear Ray, Slowing Ray, Sleep Ray, Petrification Ray, and the Telekinetic Ray. Most of them are pretty self-explanatory, including the stated status effect on a failed save. Or with the Telekinetic Ray, letting the Beholder restrain and telekinetically move a creature or manipulate objects at a distance. Then there's the three Damaging Rays, the Innervation Ray, the Disintegration Ray, and the Death Ray. The Innervation Ray is the weakest, only dealing 8d8 Necrotic on a failed save but does still do half damage on a success, unlike the other two. The Disintegration Ray does a higher 10d8 damage on a failed save, and any creature reduces their hit points by it has their body turned to dust. Finally, the Death Ray is the deadliest at 10d10 necrotic damage on a failed save that instantly kills any creature reduced to zero hit points by it. The Beholder also gets three legendary actions where it uses one random ray each time. Each ray has its own little mechanics entry, but that's not even the most complicated part about the Beholder. Famously, the Beholder's enormous central eye projects an anti-magic field in a gargantuan 150-foot cone that it points at an area at the start of its turn. This is one of the most geometrically challenging abilities in the game, as projecting a cone that big in three-dimensional space from a creature that is always floating in the air, and keeping track of that on the battlefield is quite an endeavor. Not to mention the natural challenges of consistency applying anti-magic to any creature in the cone, such as making sure players are taking into account lost passive magic effects, negating the effects of any magical equipment, temporarily losing concentration effects, or any buffs they might have cast on themselves otherwise. Beholders, as befits their notoriety, are quite a complex creature to run just for the sheer number of unique abilities it has and the innate chaos of having to use these rays at random. A dungeon master can even play a strategy around how to use this inherently random monster. And at number 7, we have Elder Brain. Elder Brain is a CR-14 aberration and acts as the central hive mind of an entire Mind Flayer colony. It's the first creature on this list with legendary resistances, which allows a legendary monster to automatically succeed on its saving throw three times a day, a trait that will be common going forward on this list. It also has three regional effects. The first makes every creature in 5 miles feel like they're being followed. The second, it can overhear telepathic communication within 5 miles of it, letting it snoop in on anyone interacting with any of the Mind Flayers in its realm or using their own telepathy, such as with a familiar. Lastly, any creature psychically linked with the Elder Brain constantly hears whispers in the recesses of its mind. Nothing too crazy, but managing a vast psychic network does present its own set of challenges to run. For layer actions, the Elder Brain can cast Wall of Force, one of the more highly complex control spells in the game. It can grant friendly creatures inspiration on a d20 roll of its choice before the end of its next turn. Finally, it can make any creature within 120 feet of it make a charisma saving throw or be unable to leave its current space, crushed by the Elder Brain's sheer force of will. As far as the Elder Brain's native abilities, it has a creature sense power that makes it always aware of the presence of any creature with 4 intelligence or higher within 5 miles of it, so long as it isn't magically protected, making stealth and infiltration in the Elder Brain's domain incredibly difficult. It also has some innate psionic spellcasting allowing it to cast Dominate Monster, Levitate, Detect Knots, or Plane Shift. For actions, it can attack with a tentacle, which does some damage and grapples a creature. It can create a psychic link with any creature that's incapacitated that detects with its creature sense ability, letting it perceive through the creature, sense its thoughts, and deceive the linked creature into believing ideas or feeling emotions through its link. It can only be broken by making a charisma save as an action. The important thing about this ability is any creature caught resting in the Elder Brain's domain can find itself immediately subject to the telepathic influence, as creature senses a 5 mile range. So over the course of multiple days delving into the Elder Brain's territory, it's very likely a party is subject to the psychic assault. It also has more direct psychic assaults in combat, with an amped up version of the Mind Flayer's Mind Blast ability, dealing 5d10 plus 5 psychic damage, and stunning the creature and all creatures that fail an intelligent saving throw within 60 feet of the brain. The Elder Brain comes with four different legendary actions. The first is its regular tentacle attack. 
Next, it can break the concentration of a spell on a creature it has a psychic link with, ending the concentration and inflicting 1d4 psychic damage per spell level. The brain can also emit a psychic pulse, dealing 3d6 psychic damage to creatures within 10 feet of any creature it's psychically linked. This ability is something it can use from its own mind flayers or the players themselves. Finally, it can sever any psychic link it has, which ends the link but gives the creature disadvantage in all saves, ability checks, and attack rolls until the end of its next turn. The Elder Brain has a lot of very odd, very unique psychic-based abilities. Its role as not only an encounter, but an omnipresent psychic threat and hub of entire civilization of incredibly dangerous psychic monsters makes it one of the most dynamic enemies in D&D. Coming in at number 6, we have vampires. In particular, Strahd von Zarovich, a particularly legendary vampire from Wizards of the Coast, Curse of Strahd campaign. Vampires are usually CR 13 undead, but the CR can be altered by variants of the vampire. Vampires have a whole host of abilities that make them especially complex. Naturally, they're legendary creatures, which gives them access to legendary resistances and legendary actions to keep track of. Admittedly, their legendary actions are fairly simple. A movement that doesn't provoke attacks as opportunity, and both of their regular attacks, an unarmed strike and a bite. Following that, it has four regional effects. First, the populations of rats, bats, and wolves in the region noticeably increase. Plants within 500 feet of the layer wither and become twisted and thorny. Shadows cast within 500 feet of its layer become abnormal and moves as if they're alive. Finally, a creeping fog clings to the ground within 500 feet of the layer, which sometimes makes horrifying forms of frightening interlopers. Vampires, unlike most creatures in D&D, have a whole slew of unusual weaknesses to keep track of. Most of these are well-known in pop culture, such as burning in the sunlight, getting staked in the heart, weaknesses in running water, etc, etc. That being said, each weakness comes with its own specific mechanical breakdown of the rules for how it will apply to vampires, which is fairly unique to them. Beyond that, vampires have an odd sort of attack pattern, needing to attack with an unarmed strike to set up their more dangerous bite, and having to choose between grappling or doing damage, as they can't bite a creature who isn't grappled or otherwise incapacitated. The bite itself is specific to vampires, as any creature slain by a vampire's bite can be risen in the following night as the vampire's spawn, meaning the vampire naturally creates its own army of fairly powerful subjects. Speaking of gaining subjects, vampires have a charm ability can use as an action to allure a creature into being the vampire's friend, ally, or protective for up to 24 hours. Then you have the odd shape-changing abilities, as they can turn into a bat or a cloud of mist. In Strahd's case, he can also turn into a wolf. The mist form has its own specific rules, which are particularly relevant, as when the vampires are reduced to zero hit points, it turns into this mist form and attempts to escape to its coffin, usually forcing an interaction with that mechanic upon defeat. Vampires come with a natural kind of regeneration that can only be surpassed by radiant damage. Vampires innately can summon swarms of rats or bats, while Strahd can also summon a large pack of wolves. Vampires also have a variant feature that gives them access to spellcasting, as is the case with Strahd. Throwing the near-endless well of mechanical intricacies that spellcasting adds to a creature is only one of the most effective ways to add complexity. Strahd adds even more layers onto this already dense list of mechanics by having additional access to layer actions and magical, giant crystal heart called the Heart of Sorrow's domain that aids him. For Strahd's layer actions, he can pass through solid objects, magically open or shut and lock doors and windows, summon a specter from the dead, or turn a player's shadow against them by manifesting it as an enemy type of shadow. The Heart of Sorrow has its own pool of hit points and absorbs damage dealt to Strahd as he wishes, giving him another odd form of regeneration to overcome. Very few creatures can demand a Dungeon Master's full attention to run properly as well as a vampire, Strahd in particular. And at number 5, we have Mummy Lord. The Mummy Lord is a CR 15 undead creature. It has three regional effects. The first causes all food, water, and non-magical drinks to spoil instantly in its lair. Creatures in its lair besides Mummy Lord who attempt to use divination spells have an added 25% chance of being misled. Lastly, any treasure taken from the lair is cursed until return, with the curse causing the target to have disadvantage in all saving throws. A nasty effect if you don't have the remove curse spell handy. The Mummy Lord also has three layer actions. The first allows any undead creature in its lair to know the location of all living creatures in the lair, letting it invalidate stuff as an option. Second, it can give all other undead in the lair advantage on saves against the effects of turn undead. Usually a crippling weakness for undead that the Mummy Lord can mitigate. Finally, and perhaps the most powerful, it can make any non-undead creature in its lair that tries to cast a 4th level or lower spell make a constitution save. And on a fail, the creature takes 1d6 necrotic damage per spell level, and the spell has no effect, wasting the spell slot. The most interesting thing about the Mummy Lord is all of these effects are layer-wide, so the Mummy Lord can activate and use its lair actions even if you're not in direct combat with it. As the players move to the Mummy Lord's lair, it can use its first action to find them, and its other two actions to hinder them once it sends its swarm of undead minions after the party, making the Mummy Lord an active threat throughout the entirety of its lair. And that's before we even get to the Mummy Lord's regular abilities. It has the spellcasting capabilities of a 10th level cleric, 
giving it powerful spells like Harm, Insect Plague, and Spiritual Weapon. The Mummy Lord's basic attack, Rotting Fist, has a side effect of causing the extremely nasty Mummy Rot curse if it hits a creature and fails a constitution save. Without Remove Curse, the target is almost certainly doomed to die if it's afflicted, as it can't be healed, and suffers a 3d6 lower to maximum hit points daily, turning them to dust if they reach zero hit points. Its other basic offensive ability is the Dreadful Glare, which you can do in tandem with its Rotting Fist. On a failed Wisdom saving throw, the target is frightened until the Mummy Lord's next turn. But if they fail by five or more, they become paralyzed, one of the nastiest effects in D&D. Extra dangerous considering the Mummy Lord, like every monster on this list, has a brevy of legendary actions it can use on the player's turns while they're paralyzed. It has three legendary actions per round. It can use them to do its basic Rotting Fist or Dreadful Glare at the cost of one action. It can also use Blinding Dust for one action to blind every creature within five feet of it if they fail a constitution save. Its next three options use two legendary actions. One allows it to channel negative energy, causing all creatures in 60 feet of it to become unable to regain hit points to the Mummy Lord's next turn. It can speak a blasphemous word to any creatures in 10 feet of it, forcing a constitution saving throw or they become stunned. And its final legendary action option, the Mummy Lord can spend two actions to magically transform into a whirlwind of sand, allowing it to move 60 feet while being immune to all damage while doing so, before reverting to its normal form afterwards. The Mummy Lord is an expert at applying multiple different status conditions on an entire party over the course of a round. Frightening, stunning, paralyzation, mummy rot, anti-healing, blindness. The sheer number of effects it can lay on a party means quite a lot of clerical work to keep track of everything it's doing in a fight. A powerful enemy with lots of effects to track and a non-stop presence throughout the entire dungeon easily earns the mummy lord spot on this list. And at number four, we have the Alitholich, also known as a Mind Flayer Lich. The Alitholich is a CR-22 variant form of both the Mind Flayer and Lich, combining the capabilities of both creatures into one Diabolic enemy. The Lich is complicated in its own right, being a high difficulty monster with lots of unique abilities and spellcasting capabilities of a full arcane caster. Some of these spells include powerful options such as Power Word Kill or Dominate Monster. Its basic attack is called Paralyzing Touch, which on hit forces a target to make a constitution saving throw or be paralyzed for one minute. As mentioned earlier, Paralyzation is one of the nastiest status effects of the game with an abundance of downsides to keep track of. The Alitha Lich takes that and adds several Mind Flayer features to its overcrowded list of features. That includes the natural psionic feature, such as the innate ability to cast Levitate, Dominate Monster, Plane Shift, and the Detect Thoughts on top of the Lich's basic spellcasting ability. The Alitha Lich also gains even more powerful versions of the Mind Flayer's Extract Brain, Mind Blast, and Tentacle attacks. The tentacle attack on hit lets the Alithalich inflict 3d10 plus 5 psychic damage, grapple the target, and make them an intelligence saving throw or be stunned until the grapple ends. And it can be quite hard to break out of the grapple if you're stunned. Extract Brain lets the Alithalich deal a catastrophic 10d10 piercing damage, which instantly kills the target if it reduces them to zero as the Alithalich consumes their brain. Finally, the Mind Blast ability works just like the previously mentioned Elder Brain's Mind Blast damaging and stunning creatures in a 60-foot cone on a failed intelligence save. As you might expect, the Alitha Lich also comes with legendary resistances and actions. The legendary actions you can use its tentacle attack, spend two actions to use Extract Brain, spend all three actions to use its Mind Blast, or spend one, two, or three actions to cast a spell at the spell slot equal to the number of legendary actions expended. The Alitha Lich also retains the Lich's Layers actions, allowing it to regain spell slots, split any damage it takes into another creature with a negative energy tether, or force a target within 60 feet of Alitha Lich to make a constitution save or suffer 15d6 necrotic damage as apparitions attack them. Beyond all of that, potentially the ability that requires the most thought and planning about both a Lich and a Lith Lich is the Rejuvenation ability that allows them to revive themselves through the phylactery when they're destroyed. While not a mechanical problem to deal with, having to come up with a suitable ingenious place to hide a phylactery that a super intelligent Lith Lich might come up with does present its own challenge. The only thing the Alitha Lich lacks as deeply complex creature is a natural way to create or take control of minions and regional effects. But the combination of two complicated and very powerful creatures that the Alitha Lich embodies earns it a spot on this list. Following that, the number three spot on this list, we have Arc Devils. In particular, Zariel. Zariel is the most powerful printed Arc Devil and a primary figure in the Descent into Avernus campaign module, although she also appears in Morden Kanan's Tome of Foes with some other Arc Devils. Zariel is a fiend that comes in at a whopping 26 challenge rating. Like many high CR creatures, she comes with interesting regional effects which includes causing gouts of fire to spew out every 60 feet within a 1 mile radius of her lair, causing heavily obscured smoke to fill everywhere within 2 miles of her lair, and manifesting screams, voices, and the smell of burning meat within 9 miles of her lair. Her stat block befits her super high challenge rating as she has several resistances including cold, fire, and most importantly, radiant damage. The latter is particularly odd for a devil, but comes from her previously being an angel before falling. 
What's more interesting is Zariel has natural regeneration that can only be stopped by radiant damage, forcing players into a suboptimal damage option to risk her constantly healing herself. She has a short list of innate spellcasting abilities that include powerful spells like Fireball, Blade Barrier, Invisibility, and Finger of Death. Like previous entries, she also comes with legendary resistances and legendary actions. She can use her legendary action to teleport up to 120 feet away, or use an immolating gaze that causes a target within 120 feet of her to combust and suffer 4d10 fire damage on a failed wisdom save. Her regular combat capabilities aren't super complicated on their own. As an action, she can use her previously explained teleport, cause a couple of different damaging attacks, and use an ability called Horrid Touch with poisons, blinds, and deafens a creature for one minute on top of doing a massive 8d10 necrotic damage on a hit. The most complicated aspect of her abilities is her layer actions. While one simply allows her to just cast the fireball spell, her other layer actions allow her to cast four simultaneous major image spells, each targeting different areas, none of which require concentration. The major image spell also forces a wisdom saving throw or frightens any creature that can see them for one minute. Major image is already a spell that challenges your creativity and imagination, but doing it four times for free every other round is on an entirely different level for a creative exercise. This ability alone is one of the most potentially complex actions in the entire game. All of her statistical abilities aside, nothing stands out more for Zaro than her role as the Archdevil of the First Slayer of Hell, known as Avernus. In a never-ending war against hordes of demons invading from the Abyss, Zaro stands as the most active Archdevil in the Nine Hells. She commands the similarly endless forces of Hell on the front lines of this war. Just being the most powerful Archdevil alone makes her fairly complex, but her political role as a commander of one of the most powerful armies in the multiverse creates a level of scale to the creature, that few others can match. Which does bring up her opposition. And at number 2, we have the Demon Lords. The Demon Lords are a group of 8 unique fiend monsters of High CR that share certain similarities. They are some of the most powerful fiends printed in the game, which naturally comes with a certain high level of complexity. Each Demon Lord has a far-reaching, terrain-warping regional effect. Though, the most interesting trait they all share is that creatures that spend an hour within a mile of the Demon Lord must make a Wisdom saving throw or be stricken by a type of madness unique to each Demon Lord. Demon Lords each come with a table of five different madness effects that is randomly chosen from when their inflicted creatures fails to save. Examples of this include Jubilix Madness that makes creatures want to consume everything they possibly can, or Grizzitz Madness which can cause afflicted players to become deeply narcissistic. Demon Lords are all legendary, as you might expect, and come with a lot of legendary actions, legendary resistances, original effects, and powerful layer actions you would expect for creatures of this status. I could talk all day about the intricacies of each Demon Lord, but there are some standout examples. One of the most implicitly complicated abilities is that of the Prince of Deception, Fraz Urblu. He has a layer action that allows him to create a perfect simulacrum of any humanoid in his layer, typically a player. The simulacrum disappears and the layer action is up again at the top of the round. There's very few things more complex than a high level player character. The fact that Fraz Urblu can imitate any and all player characters every other turn means that this one ability has the potential to be as complicated and intricate as every single player in a party combined. All of the Demon Lords have innate spellcasting abilities, usually attuned to whatever domain they represent, such as Zugmoy, the Demon Lord of Fungi, Rot and Decay, having access to fungus-themed plant growth and tangle, and so on. Orcus, the Demon Lord of Undead, has multiple abilities that summon undead monsters for, including one of his lair actions, his legendary wand's ability to cast Finger of Death and Anime Dead, and the spell Create Undead that he knows as a passive ability. And on top of all of that, he is capable of using Time Stop, which allows him multiple turns to summon an undead horde. There are many more examples of each Demon Lord's unique capabilities that could likely earn all of them a spot on this list. Each of them encompasses an entire domain, rules over endless hordes of demons loyal and fearful to them, and command an extremely high place in their cosmic hierarchy of Dungeons and Dragons. Few, if any, creatures come with the inherent complexities of including a full-fledged Demon Lord in your campaign, with perhaps the exception of the next spot on our list. Topping this list at number 1, we have Oral. Oral is the main antagonist of the Rhyme of the Frostmaiden adventure module published by Wizards of the Coast. She is an evil goddess of winter and cruelty. As a potential final boss of the campaign, she takes on a weakened form of her usual godlike powers that allows the players to actually fight her. Oral is fairly unique amongst enemies in D&D because she has three separate forms. A monstrous humanoid owl creature, a statuesque feminine form made of ice, and a floating gem-like form. Each form has to be defeated in succession, effectively making her as complicated as three distinct creatures. She has three layer actions. She can teleport anywhere in her layer, telepathically communicate with anyone in it, and automatically knows the health and locations of all creatures there. Fairly straightforward. But it functionally lets her play as if she has all the knowledge the Dungeon Master would, which is a completely different mindset than most monsters can operate with. Not quite as complicated as some of the layer actions of the previous entrances list, but we're just getting started. Her forms individually aren't super complicated on their own. 
though bouncing from one form to the next means you have to keep up with a long list of abilities and resources. Each form comes with legendary resistances and actions. Although each form has a separate two uses of legendary resistances, giving her a total of six across all three forms. Each form has one or two distinct legendary action abilities, as well as the ability to attack with the actions. One form has the spell casting feature, one has the ability to summon creatures, and one creates multiple AoE conditions that just need to be juggled with while running her. Her damage resistances, vulnerabilities, condition immunities, and even her armor class all change as she shifts forms. Which itself can cause a bit of stumbling confusion as one turn a player might hit on a 14, but on the next, miss on an 18. Something the dungeon master can easily slip up on as well. Even her size in the battle map changes, while her entry in the book doesn't technically come with any inherent regional effects like the previous entries in this list, the entire premise of the campaign module is that she has created an everlasting winter over a near continent sized area of the planet Toril. An effect so powerful it goes beyond a typical regional effect. While the entries in this list have implied armies or storytelling features associated with them, Oral is a central presence of an entire adventure module like Strahd and Zariel. Only she has the auspices of being a goddess with an entire religion behind her on top of everything else. Between her near omniscient and omnipresent status on the battlefield, the full array of legendary abilities, and the density of having three separate, complicated creatures all tied together, and her status as an actual deity, Oral easily takes the spot of 5th edition's most complicated enemy so far. Alright, and that's the list. Are there any other complicated monsters that I left out that you think should have been on this list? Or do you have any ideas for other topics you'd like me to cover like this one? If so, leave the suggestions down below in the comments. And thanks for watching.